Good evening, everybody. I'm Chris Beginski. Tonight, there has been a lot of discussion about the proposed closing of the 9-11th airlift wing. And two of the main people who are in support of keeping the 9-11th airlift wing open are with me here tonight. Joining me tonight is Chip Hallsworth, chairman of the Military Affairs Council of Western Pennsylvania, and Sally Haas, president of the Pittsburgh Area Airport Chamber of Commerce. Thank you both for joining me tonight. Thanks for having us. We're happy to be here, Chris. Well, the first thing we want to do is we want to inform everybody who is watching this, what exactly is the 9-11th Airlift Wing? Well, it's a, uh, I'll take that one. It's an Air Force Reserve Wing. Uh, I was stationed there for many years. Uh, the flying mission there, which is uh, with C-130 aircraft, an airlift, airdrop uh, airplane that you see parked out there, uh, handles uh, all sorts of mission in, in any conflict or even in peacetime and in uh, relief efforts and so forth, both the landing troops and supplies on the ground and also airdropping them from the air. Uh, it can't be forgotten, though, that the 171st Air Refueling Wing is out there at the airport, too, and that's an Air National Guard wing. Uh, the two of them are the reserve forces of the United States, or part of the reserve forces, the Air National Guard and Air Force Reserve. The uh, 171st uh, Air Refueling Wing, uh, the Air Force has proposed cutting their aircraft uh, with this force structure change that we're dealing with. Uh, the 9-11th Airlift Wing, however, uh, they're proposing not only taking the aircraft away, which are normally assigned eight aircraft, uh, but they're also going to close the base. It's the only uh, uh, base in this force structure change that uh, is actually proposed to be closed. And uh, our big problem, and the reason that Sally and I and a, a very big team of folks is involved in this, growing larger by the day with uh, great uh, political support, is that the Air Force, Department of Defense, and, and the big Air Force, we might call it the Active Duty Air Force, has decided that uh, the planes that are here now, the C-130s, are the oldest ones in the Air Force inventory. Um, we did have the newest ones at one time. In the last couple of years, the active duty has taken them and moved them to active duty locations and given old ones back here to replace them at Pittsburgh. And our argument is not that, hey, we just need to have a, a contingent of Air Force Reserve here at Pittsburgh, although we all certainly don't want to lose our airlift wing or the Air Force Reserve presence. but. But the argument is much deeper than that, and it's something that people don't understand, and that is that uh, it's been studied over and over in the past decade and maybe two decades as to what's the mix of the forces that there should be, active duty, reserve, reserve forces, which are guard and reserve. And it's been shown repeatedly for many, many reasons that I could go on and discuss here far beyond our program time that the active duty is much, much costlier. And I mean, they pay them to do everything. The personnel costs are the most expensive uh, cost that the military has. The reserve, however, as I'm sure Sally will talk about, because she's great on these statistics and numbers, especially as they affect the community, the reserve can operate uh, for as little as one quarter of the cost of active duty. And we've had many commissions. In fact, I sat as a staff member on the Commission for the Guard and Reserve a few years ago. And we studied this and recommended to Congress that uh, we needed to keep and perhaps grow the reserve forces and decrease the active forces. Well, this is happening in the Army. It's happening in the Marines. But for some reason, the Air Force isn't doing that. And they need to look at the data involved in this. I mean, that's the big issue behind this, is the data. You know, they're closing what is probably, uh, and we're going mostly on data that the Air Force hasn't substantiated to us yet, but it's a couple years old, is probably the most cost-effective airlift wing or flying wing in the Air Force Reserve. I mean, it costs less to have these eight airplanes here with the support we get from Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh Airport, Pittsburgh community, uh, than it does anywhere else in the Air Force. So why in the world would you close it? So, so our politicians asked uh, 
asked the Air Force a week before last, you know, why? What data are you, are you basing this on? And they admitted they did not use the data. So that's what we're doing. That's our job. <laughs> and everybody who's on our team, which is a bunch. And the 9-11th is also a very historic unit in the fact that it's been around since the 40s, and they're proposing the closing of this particular unit. Well, yes, the 9-11th goes back to uh, the end of World War II. There have been active duty here. There have been the Air, Air, Air Force has been on this airport since 1945, I believe it was. Uh, but. You know, there's many other historic units around the country and in the world and everything, and we can't base it. We've got a budget crunch facing us here, and the Department of Defense has to make cuts. But they've said the 65 oldest C-130s can go. We don't need so many C-130s, according to, to their data, which apparently they didn't use. <laughs> but uh, so that's fine. I mean, I can see retiring the oldest airplanes. But that doesn't mean part of this force structure change is moving planes around. You're taking four planes from here and putting them at this base. You're taking two from here and putting them at this base. And uh, for some reason, which no one can justify, is they've left Pittsburgh out of the picture. And that's, our pro that's the problem. And this is actually the second time they've tried to close it down, has it not? It's actually the third time. Third, third time. Third, but we don't want to confuse it with what happened before because mm -hmm. the previous two efforts were under what's called a BRAC, which are, is a, a base realignment and closure. And this is not that. This is really, as Chip indicated, uh, the response by the Air Force to uh, what was a proposed bill, a budget control bill uh, act, or, you know, to, to get the armed forces to reduce their spending. So they came out with this $487 billion proposal of cuts. Now, when that comes out, you know, the, the uh, apparent reasoning behind it is they want to uh, reduce, uh, streamline the, the force. They want to uh, make sure there's rapid response and readiness. Uh, they're, they're looking at how they can cut costs in the personnel area. And uh, so this is all part of that initiative. So there's a very, very big picture here, $487 billion, again, that's with a B, uh, worth of cuts. Obviously, when you're reducing spending uh, so significantly, uh, you know, you're, everybody's saying, yeah, we think that should be happening. But of course, people are going to say, yeah, well, it's okay until it's in your backyard. But that's not the position that we're taking here. What we're looking at is, there has to be an overarching strategy, uh, and there has to be reasoning when they're pointing to who's staying open and who's closing. And getting back to Chip's point, that's what's been called into question. You know, how and why our base is being closed. Yeah, some of our uh, Western Pennsylvania, especially, and the, the two senators included, have been criticized for jumping out ahead on this thing and, and questioning the Department of Defense as to what why are you doing this? And uh, they've been criticized uh, from several sources for that, and that is so wrong. I mean, we have here a joint uh, contingent of, of our congressmen, uh, both Democrats and Republicans, recognizing this and standing up for it, and not just demanding that the base stay open, it's demanding that some reasoning be done, some data be used. And if you're going to cost savings, if you're going to cut costs, Cutting a place that costs perhaps a quarter to one third of the cost of other changes does does not make sense. So what we're calling into question is the fact that uh, this mandate was issued that our base would be closed. However, when we do our head count, and just to kind of help people get a better idea of what the presence is at the 9-11th airlift wing, you're looking at 54 active duty you're looking at around 1,400 reservists, and you're looking at 318 civilians being engaged at this site, 318 civilians being employed. And that threshold where the military cannot just come in and do a closure is 300 employees, civilian employees. Well, I did say 318 here. So that's been drawn into you know the forefront because the, uh, the military are using a 283 yeah. or some such number. We're going with 318, which is documented, 
So there's this disparity between these numbers. So when our congressional leaders uh, came in to do this, uh, to, to put a stop to this, to question it, they were absolutely appropriate. Look, we want to keep jobs. We want to keep people here in, in the backyard, but there's bigger things at stake here. There's homeland security. There is that joint readiness. There is having active reserves. And we're already a model of efficiency, a model of joint readiness, and, you know, the cost effectiveness on top of that. Yeah. Both the Guard and the Reserve here. I mean, everything Sally's saying here, we can almost ditto for the Air National Guard here. Uh, it just doesn't make sense. And she. She mentioned these figures. I think some people can probably be critical. Well, if you've got 318 employees, it's only 18 over the 300 cutoff that, that the law says, Title 10 says that over 300 employees, you have to have a base realignment and closure commission appointed and close, which happened in 1995 and 2005, which Pittsburgh was named to close. And, and we discovered that the data used was terribly wrong. In fact, you know, this is a, an amazing statistic when you look at it, but they had Pittsburgh listed as the most costly base in the reserve forces to keep open. Uh, by the time our group went through it, and we had several months this time, this time we have a couple weeks. Uh, by the time we went through that, we proved that Pittsburgh was the least costly, the opposite end of the list. So all it took in that choice was some mispitched data. They had the wrong figures used. We figure that's happening again, or they haven't looked at it at all, one or the other. It's, it's amazing. And, and you know, Sally said about the numbers of people here and all, and, and she'll tell you in a moment about the effects on the community. And a lot of people say, well, so it's 318 full-time civilian positions authorized. Uh, that's not a horrendous amount of money, and the rest of them are reservists, 1,400. And, and whatever would be lost, for, that's at the 9-11th wing. There's also those from the Air National Guard. But you know, many of those reservists rely upon their Air Force Reserve job. Some of them is a full-time job, and many of the, probably most of the rest of them for a supplemental income. They don't go out and work at uh, some other second job in the night. They work defending our country for the reserve forces. And there's a big difference there. And the effect on the community is tremendous. And let's talk a little bit about that, because you're talking to quite a few people right now who are viewing this in the Moon community area. So if you could actually, Sally, talk a little bit about the positive impact that having the 9-11th here and the Air National Guard here has on the local economy. All right, well, let's just uh, talk about, first of all, what the overall economic impact is when I mentioned the, the headcount that was out there, the 54 active duty, the 1,400 reservists, and the 318 civilians. Pull that out, we lose 1,400, excuse me, $114 million right there in, in that uh, initial blush of, of salaries and, and impact. Now, other things that are going on are contracted services at the base. This is what just keeps it flowing every single day. You're going to lose about $6.4 million in contracted services. Now, these people live, work, play. You know a lot of these people. They could be your neighbors. The kids are in school. You know, they're in your community. And they're, they're living and investing in those communities. So dollars into schools, dollars into local municipalities. That's going to uh, run you just shy of $30 million. Taken out of your community, this is a lot of money to lose. This is a real impact. And I do want to say we're looking at over 2,500 jobs gone. Sally, it isn't just your community either. It isn't just Moon Township. No, no, no. I mean, you're looking throughout the entire region. That's, you know, the reason why I'm saying we know these people because, for example, let's take reservists, 1,400 reservists, as we pointed out. Uh, they're coming in from 26 different states. Far away is Washington, D.C., Washington State of, and California. Uh, for the most part, though, they're coming in from Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia, many of them very local. So when you look at the fact that they come here, they're staying in local hotels, they're enjoying entertainment throughout the region, they're enjoying restaurants, you know, they're, they're out in the community. So, you know, they're enjoying our sports teams. They're all coming in. They're living like a Pittsburgher that one weekend of the month. So it's, it's a very big number to take out of our local economy. 
local, meaning the, the region at large. And because of that, you've been having a, a lot of support from local politicians on both sides of the aisle. Who is it that's been stepping yes. up to come and support? Well, I, I couldn't say any one in particular. I mean, uh, Congressman Tim Murphy is, is in his district, so he's got to be the lead on it, uh, on the House side of the, the thing. But boy, what's, what's amazing is they're teaming together and uh, forgetting any political differences that so often occur. And uh, we're getting good bipartisan support. In fact, uh, Sally and I met with several of them in Washington, D.C. a couple weeks ago with a couple, few other folks. Uh, we're probably going down next week uh, to discuss things. See, one of the things we're doing with our teams, and we're meeting... Uh